first conversation, we're going to do something different. It's on a, it's a conversation, can we dig ourselves out of what's coming, dredging, beneficial reuse, and measure AA. We're doing a call to action, and each conversation is going to be led by somebody who is going to give their perspective for five minutes on that issue and the issue as a whole. And um, then the panel is going to take over, and it's going to be a dialogue amongst the panel. Uh, what I did not mention earlier, the last 20 minutes of the conversation, Jack Fischetti back there and myself will hold mics. We'll be going to the audience and taking questions from the audience. We encourage the questions, however, you can state your name and your company, but if you make a statement or you're selling something, the mic gets pulled away and we go on to the next person. So we, we want to make sure that the questions are asked. It is now my pleasure to enter, turn the call to action over to uh, Larry Goldsband, the Executive Director of BCDC. Thank you, John. So it is different to have a call to action. And one of the things that I think all of us think about when we have a call to action is we try to think about our own world and then expand it. So given the increasing depressing news about needs to use that. Given the increasingly depressing news about climate change, we are lucky that there is probably no location in the United States that can more effectively use clean dredge materials to build and restore large and small scale natural wetlands to safeguard communities of all types than San Francisco Bay. There is significant across the board public support for such proposals because they provide multi-objective environmental and economic benefits, including flood protection, recovery of endangered species, expanded and improved habitat, and upgraded water quality. We're fortunate because two to three million cubic yards of sediment are dredged to maintain bay channels annually, while the long-term management strategy that oversees dredging disposal has ensured that much of the materials are reused beneficially, much of the dredge material is still squandered. As a community, including the federal government, we need to move the dirt to multiple wetland restoration sites, totaling over 20,000 acres that are in need of sediment including Montezuma, Belmarin Keys, South Bay Salt Ponds, and Cullinan Ranch. The incremental cost of moving just the volume dredged by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Bay is less than five to ten million dollars annually. Yet, even if I climbed to the top of the ferry building, grabbed Dumbledore's wand and used it as a megaphone, and told everyone in this room in the Bay Area that BCDC has approved significant volumes of fill for ports, marinas, habitat, and other uses, and does not per se oppose filling the bay to restore or create wetlands, or to provide flood protection in other ways, many people will continue to believe that our staff unalterably opposes such fill. That is not the case. While filling the bay for any purpose must continue to be justified, we all know that BCDC's next 50 years will be very different from its first, and that rising sea level will compel us to add additional fill to the bay to conserve and develop its resources. I encourage you to pay attention to BCDC's May 19th meeting, at which our commissioners and alternates will discuss, debate, and vote on various proposals to move adaptation policies forward. In addition, we need to change federal law, as Eric described, to require the Corps to move dredge material to beneficial reuse sites and require the EPA to create a holistic federally sponsored bay restoration program, as they have done for the Chesapeake and Puget Sound. We need to challenge all regulatory agencies to play the multi-species long game to enhance the Bay ecosystem. And we need to figure out how, as regulatory agencies, we can work together more efficiently while fulfilling our publicly required mandates. So my call to action is very simple. We have to do all of that. Josh, all up to you. I bet everybody can hear me now sure about those guys. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, Larry, thank you for the call to action. And uh, John, thank you to you and your staff, of course, for hosting this event every year. It's great to get everybody together. 
My name is Dr. Josh Burnham. I'm a principal planner with the firm Anchor QEA, and I'm very happy to be the moderator of this first panel discussing dredging and dredge material beneficial reuse in the Bay. Um, I think it'd be a good idea for each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, hoping their mics are now working. You guys want to quickly introduce yourselves and who you're with? I'm Bill Dutra from the uh, Dutra Group, and it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. I'll just pass around here. Good morning. I'm David Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of Save the Bay. Amy Hutzel, Deputy Executive Officer at the State Coastal Conservancy. And my name is Al Panisha. I'm the Navigation Business Line Manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in San Francisco, and I hope I'm not the bad guy today. <laughs> no, but you are the recipient of the first question, which is why I conveniently stood next to you. So like John uh, explained and demonstrated earlier, we have the clicker technology today and the way our panel has kind of decided to organize the time that we have before we go to audience Q&A is we're going to basically ask three questions and then kind of organize ourselves around those modules. So it looks like the first question is already up on the screen. And that question is, what do you believe is the greatest barrier to more beneficial reuse in the Bay? What do you believe is the greatest barrier to more beneficial reuse in the Bay? So if we can get a vote, we can get some reaction from our panelists before I pick on Al. So what do you believe is the greatest barrier to more beneficial reuse in the bay? It looks like it was kind of a tie between cost and legislation with LTMS goals coming in third and very few people saying technology. Before I ask Al a question, any reaction to that from the panel? Do you guys agree or, or disagree on that? Money doesn't always solve problems, but often does. Okay. So Al, first question, keeping in mind these answers, and I won't say anything that rhymes with Warda. What are the core's opportunities and constraints? What is the core's role in solving this dilemma? Uh, thanks, Josh. That's a very good question. Um, you've already heard from uh, Larry that uh, our biggest constraint, I'm going to start with constraints because it's always bad news first, is um, our, I don't want to say inability, but the difficulty we have in beneficially reusing uh, sediment from our federal channels. And that constraint is essentially codified in 33 CFR 336.1C1. It is the court's policy to regulate the discharge of dredge material from its projects to assure that dredge material disposal occurs in the least costly, environmentally acceptable manner consistent with engineering requirements established for the project. So, least cost is the driver. Um, we do our best to, to beneficially use material wherever we can. And actually, in fact, this past year, 2015, we were just tallying up the numbers for our integrated alternatives analysis. And we are close to 925,000 cubic yards of sediment going to beneficial use, and went to beneficial use in 2015. So you're, you're wondering, how are we able to do that when I just said we have this constraint that prevents us from doing that? Um, well, put simply, we dredged most of that material outside the environmental window of November 30th, and in accordance with, with the uh, new uh, LTMS programmatic biological opinion, we do not have to consult formal consultation with NOAA fisheries if we take the material to beneficial use and it benefits to the impact of species. I don't want to say that is our solution to beneficial use, but I think that's a pretty good, a good news story to uh, tell everyone that we um, achieved almost a million cubic yards, 43% of the program. Um, the other, the other uh, sorry, the other big constraint is, uh, as you've already heard, is the funding situation. Uh, dredging it, it comes out of the uh, O&M navigation uh, funding pot from headquarters, and that's uh, highly competitive and not a growing pot. And we compete, each one of our projects uh, competes individually with every other uh, project in the nation. So this uh, simple fact of the matter is that there isn't enough money to go around. We can do about 50% of our work, and to increase the cost is um, problematic as far as uh, actually getting additional funds for beneficial use. Okay, that's enough of the bad news. Um, how, about, how about the opportunities? Well, I can think of a, a couple right now. 
that um, have the potential to increase beneficial use. And um, one that we're really excited about is our uh, frame, framework for the strategic placement of dredge sediment in the aquatic environment to nourish um, marsh, marshes. Um, this is a relatively new um, thing that we're looking at, and the idea is to address the uh, the um, declining sediment budget in the in the Bay Area by taking our sediment and strategically placing it in locations that will eventually nourish uh, wetlands. Um, we're in the early stages of this uh, study, and we're currently working on a framework that would uh, look at the feasibility of this type of um, action and um, developing a roadmap and how to actually make it work. So in the next couple of months, we'll be engaging our stakeholders and um, interested uh, parties to seek their input and help us develop this roadmap. Um, another uh, opportunity that we're uh, looking at is the P3 partnering that uh, headquarters has been promoting, and that is a P3. It's, uh, I'm not sure what that means other than public, public, private. Um, it means um, the core would enter into a, a, a relationship with a state or local agency who would all in turn enter into a private arrangement. And the idea is to bring new money into the into the program and generate a revenue stream so that um, we can accomplish uh, maintenance dredging at a lower cost to the federal government. So this is also um, a relatively new development and we're exploring what, how that would actually work. Um, uh, one potential idea that's been thrown around is to have um, um, one of the, uh, the federal government or the uh, the state agency procure a dredging plant or offloader and turn that into a, a, a venture that generates income through a private party and that way additional dredging projects that we can't dredge actually do get dredged. Um, another opportunity that we're looking at is the, the, um, the core itself procuring an offloader type of equipment to, um, for the use of everyone who needs an offloading a piece of equipment for their project. And um, we believe that there's enough um, projects out there and, and enough need for sediment that uh, more than one offloader in the Bay Area would be a good thing. It would, um, one, I know we already have one offloader up there at Montezuma. Um, but we have a, a need for multiple offloaders and that, that one offloader can't do all the projects that were mentioned at the same time. Gosh. Those are some great points. Does anybody else want to react to anything that Al said? I know, Amy, we oh, talked about I have one more, Rob. One more thing. It's the traditional Section 204. I'll just give a shout out to the Traditional Authority for Beneficial Use, Section 204, word in 1992. Um, amended by order 2007. Um, simply put, that allows the core to beneficially reuse uh, dredged material um, from its projects. And the incremental cost is cost shared 35% uh, by non federal partner. So that is still there available. It's a project by project authority, but it it's, um, doesn't mean the, uh, non, the, the local sponsor has to pay for the entire cost, it's a 35% cost share of that additional cost. So if it costs $5 million to dredge um, Oakland and beneficially uh, um, use it, that's 35% uh, of $5 million is uh, $1,750,000. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thanks, Al. Amy? Yeah. Um, well, I would just start off with... Um, kind of echoing what Larry, Larry was saying, um, the call to action. I, I think we've done, you know, a reasonably good job with beneficial reuse. It hasn't been perfect, but projects have happened. Sonoma Baylands and Hamilton, um, Montezuma, um, uh, 
inner Bear Island was done with, with construction dirt, we have been able to get uh, dirt to some projects. I think it's really about um, increasing the, the scale and pace of beneficial reuse, uh, especially given um, sea level rise and the decreased sediment concentrations in San Francisco Bay. The Baylands Goals Report, the update, um, we just came out with that last year, and it laid out recommendations for wetlands restoration around the Bay and basically um, called for accelerating the pace and scale of wetlands restoration and getting most of our large-scale restoration projects done by 2030 um, so that these wetlands will be able to keep up with sea level rise. If we wait too long to restore these um, diked bay lands, uh, former salt ponds around the bay, then they won't be able to um, you know, finish up natural sedimentation and vegetate and then keep up with sea level rise. They will be starting um, at, at, a, um, at a deficit, really, once the sea level rise curve kicks in. So I, I think we, we, um, we've had some successes, but we need, we need to um, increase those successes and make it um, much more uh, the way we do business in San Francisco Bay. I think it's great that 2015, um, a significant um, portion of the dredge material went to beneficial reuse. In 2013, 1.3 million cubic yards um, went to deep ocean. So in 2015, it, you know, it went to beneficial reuse, as Al was saying, because it happened outside the work windows. I don't think we want to rely on that um, uh, going forward is the way we make beneficial reuse of O&M material uh, happen. So I, I do agree, you know, it's the, the federal standard. Um, that's the kind of the nut we have to crack uh, on the O&M material. And then figuring out how those incremental costs get paid. And, um, and money can help, but we also, um, we have significant needs around San Francisco Bay's shoreline. We will be having significant needs. Um, for green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. The costs are going to be huge, and we need to make sure that we're doing this beneficial reuse in the most um, cost-effective way uh, that we can. I think the wetland restoration community, we want to be preparing these sites. Um, that's what we're doing at Belmer and Keys. That's what we're doing uh, in the South Bay at, at Eden Landing. Um, we are taking a bit of a risk prepping these sites because. I, I, you know, I don't feel assurance that if we build it, the mud will come. Um, and uh, it would be great to figure out lower cost ways of getting the dredge material to these sites, such as an aquatic transfer facility. And I, I am hopeful that the strategic placement studies that the Corps um, is doing will help us move things like the aquatic transfer facility along as well. I think strategic placement um, could be really helpful. Um, you know, it's better to have the sediment stay in the bay than to go to deep ocean, uh, even if it's not going directly to a wetland restoration site. But we do have these deeply subsided sites around the bay, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that strategic placement alone is going to, to um, uh, enable us to restore these, these lands. So I think it's a, <clears throat> a combination of um, I'm going to hand it off because I know I've got a call. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, David, I, got to, I think I know you'd like to weigh in, but I think maybe if you don't mind holding just for one second or maybe until we put up the next question, maybe just a quick question for Bill. Well, I, you know, you've heard a lot here today, and, and what, what the core is saying, what Larry is saying is, is here, at least in this region, we, uh, we have been relying on the uh, O&M and the core budget to... Uh, to try to do our do our work and, and and frankly we all know that it's limited we've had the opportunity to have some great cap capital uh, construction projects uh, deepening through the last three decades and now we have the challenge of maintaining and maintaining the bay and uh, I think we need uh, a regional uh, sediment uh, uh, group to put together to augment uh, uh, and fund uh, assisting the cores. I have to look at the cores 
is there a, there a foundation, but if we're going to take care of our infrastructure and we're going to maintain what we uh, lobbied hard to, to build here to improve our uh, commerce, uh, I, I truly believe that we need a partnership with the environmental side and uh, tap, on, tap into their resources in, in making this uh, beneficial use work. So Bill, how do we, how do we get from one offloader to two, in your opinion? Huh? How do we get another offloader? What's the barrier? I didn't hear offloader. offloader. How do we get another sediment offloader? How do we get another? Well, I, I think the offloader, uh, I've, I've heard about this, uh, the offloader situation, and I think, frankly, the offloader that we have today that's, that's in the bay uh, is, is basically underutilized. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to believe that uh, we need more off, offloaders, and, uh, and I think if we have a regional plan and we have a consistent uh, work, uh, the entrepreneurialness of the dredging industry will, will follow. I, I don't think uh, we should be uh, unsightful that when the uh, Hamilton Field operation came along and the deepening of the 52-foot project, the, the loader that was here in the bay uh, partnered and moved that loader over to help facilitate uh, the the wetlands uh, wetland area. I think that if we had a defined long-term strategy and we had a long-term benefit in reference to where our uh, material was going to go, then I think you'll find that the uh, that the dredging dredging industry as a whole uh, will 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 capitalize to it and, and be very competitive. There's this message is not new in the United States right now. There are regional sediment programs on the East Coast, in the Gulf. I think we're just on the cusp of, of really realizing to meet our needs, we're not going to be able to do it with the O&M money. I want to move on to the next question to make sure we have time, but maybe it's 30 seconds of follow-up, Bill. Since we do have the one right now, how do we bring down the cost of the use of that offloader? Well, I think the way you really bring down the cost is, is uh, as you see on the big capital projects, if you can, if you can define and, and, and streamline, or I don't want to say streamline, but to clarify, you take maintenance dredging. <clears throat> we know on maintenance dredging, uh, the, the areas have already been tested, they've already been evaluated. We spend a lot of time in testing, we do a lot of time in evaluating. I think that if we developed a partnership, really developed a partnership with the environmental agencies to be part of the process of, if you want to call it streamlining or cost effectively going through versus looking at pet studies, and I don't mean to be critical, but we, we find ourselves into very tight time windows and we find ourselves into very uh, underutilized uh, uh, equipment. So I think that's an area that if we could partner on that side, I think you will find the dredging costs uh, to come, uh, come down. I think what you're really finding is, uh, is, is the delay and then the time schedule of, of doing it. There is an area that I think is important. A lot of the equipment that you see in San Francisco Bay was designed for the past. The deepening, going to the herd, you're going to the ocean, you're going upland. There's a lot of difference in the capitalization of taking a dredge fleet and designing it to go 61 miles out in the ocean, or designing it to go uh, to go upland. Those are big capital, a uh, big capital cost, and they're very in, they go into very environmentally sensitive areas that it takes it takes very competent equipment and people to take care of. Okay, well, we've heard a lot of discussion of uh, partnership and, and cost. Let's bring up the next question. How do you plan to vote on Measure AA? Yes, no, or undecided? Paul Ryan is not a choice. <laughs> yes, no, or undecided? A lot of yeses. A couple no's and a few undecided. So, David, maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of Measure AA, maybe in light of some of the things you heard from the other panelists and maybe try to change the mind of some of the no's and the undecided votes. Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Measure AA is a tiny tax for a huge benefit. For those who don't know, uh, the proposal is on the ballot in 
all nine Bay Area counties on the June 7th ballot, which means those of you who vote by mail will have a ballot in your mailbox in a week. This is the end of a 13-year journey to give the Bay Area as a whole an opportunity to vote for the future health of the Bay. That $12 per parcel tax over 20 years would raise a half a billion dollars for tidal marsh restoration projects, the flood protection that is required as part of those projects and the public access that can come with those projects. We've never before had an opportunity to act as a region on something like this. We've never before had an opportunity as a whole Bay Area, 3.5 million voters to vote for the Bay. And it's the best chance in a generation to improve the Bay's health because we have 30,000 acres of areas already purchased, mostly by the public, some in private hands, and reserved for the purpose of wetland restoration. 30,000 acres that, as Amy said, uh, will be much easier to restore if we accelerate the pace of restoration. And we've gotten very good at it, using dredge material in areas where that's needed and in areas where that's not. And you all know the benefits of tidal marsh for fish and wildlife, for water quality, for open space and recreation, and for helping protect the shoreline against climate change, the green infrastructure in a less expensive way than building seawalls and taller levees. Now, in some places, we won't have that opportunity to protect the shoreline with wetland restoration, but in these 30,000 acres, we do. And what's on the other side of those parcels? Communities where people live, roads and sewage treatment plants and railroads that we all use and need, and really important businesses that make this a vibrant economy. So it's tough, though, because uh, with California's uh, tax laws, this has to pass by two-thirds of the people that actually vote on it in the combined nine counties, and that's a really high bar. Uh, we can do it, and the popularity and breadth of support for this measure uh, is really encouraging. We have more than a thousand endorsements from individuals and organizations, starting from Governor Brown uh, on down and uh, in every local community. The Bay Planning Coalition, the Bay Area Council, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, these leading business coalitions in the region have all endorsed the measure and are working for its passage. And in this room, sponsors of this conference today, PG&E and Chevron in particular, uh, have contributed significant funds to the campaign uh, because it's a good return on investment. Just those two companies alone have contributed $300,000 to the campaign to pass this measure, and that's a tenth of what the total cost will be. So I want to thank those companies. Public agencies as well have stepped up to help with this. Sonoma County Water Agency, uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District in particular who are here. So instead of speaking to the clickers who voted no and who are undecided, uh, and not just you, but to the, to the people who support this measure, um, I want to highlight the importance of you doing something other than just voting for this measure in the next four weeks. Because everybody in this room who wants to see more beneficial reuse needs to support this measure. If this measure loses, we continue fighting over the crumbs, the trickle of funds that are available for preparing these sites to even receive beneficial uh, uh, dredge material, beneficial reuse of dredge material. There's a trickle of funds to do that. It'll be stretched out over decades. If we pass this measure, not only do we have, not only have we grown the pie by a half billion dollars, but it puts us in a much better position to leverage more federal funds. The Bay gets a fraction of the federal funding that other estuaries around the nation, Puget Sound, Chesapeake Bay, get. It's not okay. We need more. And this is another way for us to leverage more. So I would say that if you are not contributing to the passage of this measure by actively telling your friends and neighbors and your employees and your colleagues to vote for it, and by contributing to the campaign, if you as an individual or business can do that, and doing it in the next week, we are about to have television ads to tell people to vote for this. Because the problem is not that there's not enough support in the Bay Area. The problem is people don't know this is on the ballot. It's on the bottom of the ballot. And whoever turns out uh, doesn't necessarily know that this is there to vote for. Yeah, some people read the ballot pamphlet carefully. And others just show up, vote for their presidential choice or their Senate choice, and move on. Some people don't get around to voting because they're lazy. We need to aggressively turn out support for this measure. And if we don't, 
we've missed a huge, huge opportunity, uh, and, and it would be a, a terrible waste. So I want to ask every company that has sponsored this conference today, and every company that's a member of the Bay Planning Coalition, to contribute something additional to this campaign. I want to thank Bill because a member of your family has contributed to this campaign. And uh, I didn't find anybody else on this list other than the companies that I've mentioned that I know have done that. If you don't want to contribute to Say the Bay, you don't have to. There's a campaign fund. And uh, other companies that are not in this room have stepped up and supported it. Facebook, Google, Kaiser, and others. It's all public information. If you want to know more, please see me or call me. But I, I strongly urge you to do what you can in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, not only to contribute financially so we can get the word out, but tell your friends and neighbors. Uh, I have to say it would be incredibly selfish to not vote for this measure uh, and to not uh, encourage other people to vote for this measure. It's against your personal interest as someone living in the Bay Area who wants the Bay to be healthy. Uh, it's against your financial interest uh, because other ways of uh, dealing with the problems that are coming are going to be more expensive. And it's against your business interests if you are supportive of more beneficial reuse of dredge material, because this is essential to uh, make those sites available. And what is it going to cost a resident of the Bay Area who owns a parcel? You know, the equivalent of two Starbucks Frappuccinos a year. <laughs> I can't give that up. I can't give that up for all of these benefits and for all of the leverage benefits, and for the, all of the economic benefits, absolutely I can, and I will. Amy or Al, any thoughts on that? Amy, can the Conservancy make use of those funds? We can uh, definitely apply those funds to projects around San Francisco Bay. And the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority website has a ton of information about how this funding will be managed, uh, what it will be spent on, the processes that we've put in place to ensure transparency, public involvement, uh, citizen oversight of the expenditures. There's a, a list and map of, of projects that are um, potentially eligible for Restoration Authority funding on the Authority's website. That includes Eden Landing and Belmer and Keys, these projects, these sites that we need to get prepped. We need to build the levees and berms and infrastructure so that they can receive uh, dredge material. And then we need to deal with this incremental cost of getting the dredge material to, to these sites. Um, it, it does uh, concern me if, um, um, if it weren't to pass, I should like be knocking on, yeah, it's going to pass, but if it, if it were to not pass, um, not only are we um, where we are now, I think we are farther and farther behind. We have significant needs um, on our shoreline uh, coming up. Um, the, the needs are, are growing greater, and the funding available from the state and the feds um, is, is not keeping pace. We are struggling um, to do these projects. Belmer and Keys, we are cobbling together what funds we have uh, to build the levy at the site. Eden Landing, we are trying to raise funds, you know, a million dollar grant here, a million dollar grant there. It's very challenging to assemble these projects. I, I think as Bill was saying, the environmental community uh, does want to work in partnership with uh, the dredging community with the ports, uh, marinas, the, the, um, the dredgers, the Corps of Engineers. Um, in order to work in partnership, we need to be able to bring um, resources uh, to the table. Uh, I, you know, with Belmer and Keys, um, it, you know, that project should be happening already. And it's been a series of, of issues that's, that's kept it from happening. I think, um, significantly um, the, uh, the demise of the aquatic transfer facility, um, which would have cut the cost in half. I definitely want to um, reinvestigate that. 
but also the states, the coastal conservancy's ability to sign a uh, cost share agreement with the Corps of Engineers for a, you know, a project that's somewhere between 220 million and half a billion dollars. You know, we can't in good faith sign that. We, we don't have those sorts of resources at this point. So um, Measure AA would uh, fill a significant gap and uh, help to move projects all around San Francisco Bay along. Al, any thoughts, Bill? Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, as, as you says, as stated, we, uh, we at Dutra support AAA -A 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 because we think it's, a, it's another uh, beneficiary to uh, help uh, take care of the O&M project and, and also beneficial use. But I think what we, we would be concerned about is, uh, is to be assured that, uh, that there is an overall regional need and define definements so that you know you want to start bringing uh, costs down uh, right now the the upland projects outside of the 52 foot projects are are, are very small uh, short start major mobilizations back and forth once uh, there is a, a regional direction and if a day if the AA program can go in and not study it for the next decade, but can start applying its resources to the efforts that have been put out there, then uh, you will you will find that uh, industry will will follow. We have a we have a major job in keeping uh, our community uh, uh, competitive. I I think that uh, dredging should stay with the dredging industry, and the, the core should stay in their industry, and the environmentals, and pull it all together, and then you'll get your cost down. Uh, you know, I heard here just recently, you know, uh, having a, a, a federal aquatic uh, dredging thing. That, uh, in, in my opinion, is, right now we do not even know what, uh, where we really want the, these sites are. So once we know the, the magnitude and the demand and the need, then, uh, then the cost will fall. Great. Well, I want to make sure we leave at least 20 minutes for audience Q&A. How are we doing? It? Good time? Okay. Well, I'm gonna, let's go ahead and bring up the third question, which I think is provocative, hopefully. and will lead to some good discussion amongst the panel and hopefully will help lead us into the Q&A, so I'll, I'll read it. A number of people have commented that market conditions that the LTMS has faced during its first 12 years have changed. Should the LTMS change its goals, given a new reality, such as reduced sediment loads in the bay, limited offloader availability, although we heard Bill's, you know, may have a different perspective on the limitation, and or not enough sites around the bay? Yes or no? I think essentially the core of this question is, do we need LTMS 2.0? I think that's the, the core of the question. I'll be interested to get perspectives from the panel and then from the audience. A lot of yes. <laughs> David, you're nodding towards me. I thought that meant you had a thought. <laughs> well, absolutely, conditions have changed and our knowledge has changed and the imperative has changed. I think every panelist has spoken to that. I'm a little anxious about um, saying we need a new LTMS process to get to an answer because the last time took a long time and you know, was driven by litigation. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. But I would say that whether it's through the LTMS process or other mechanisms, we need to up the pressure and uh, increase the demand for more sediment to be beneficially reused. And we need to change the economics of it. And I'll just say something that I've been saying for 20 years from my perspective. The, the Corps of Engineers is carrying out a federal interest in maintaining navigation. That's a shared public interest that's been determined. We also have a shared public interest in improving our environment and not wasting a precious resource by dumping it in the ocean where it doesn't have any benefit. So there should be a higher level of federal uh, resource support through the federal cost share for beneficial projects that create multiple benefits than for projects that only create the benefit of maintaining navigation. 
And the easiest way to do that without spending more total money is keep the total pot of money for a federal subsidy for these projects the same, but create a spread. And the beneficial reuse projects get a relatively higher federal cost share, and the detrimental dumping projects get a relatively lower federal cost share. We know that that kind of spread um, in economics drives behavior. And uh, I'm not suggesting that is necessarily an easy thing to legislate through Congress, but um, we, are, we are not advancing the public interest with public dollars as much as we should be with the current system that doesn't make as much of a distinction in terms of federal cost share uh, between those two types of projects. Al, any thoughts on that? Well, I was going to uh, comment on the LTMS program itself, the value of it uh, over the years. Um, I don't necessarily, well, I'm not sure if the main goal of the program has changed at all to maximize uh, the beneficial use of sediment. That was the original goal all along, and it was basically reduce and minimizing in bay to 20% of the program overall. And then the remaining 80% ideally would go to beneficial use. And the 40% for the ocean, that was the uh, safety valve when, you know, the beneficial use sites slowly came online. Now, has that changed at all? Are we, we're still striving for that main goal to maximize beneficial reuse and reuse, correct? I mean, so um, what would the new LTMS 2.0 paradigm look like then? So that's what I'm suddenly wondering. Go ahead. You want to go ahead? <laughs> I, I, I do worry a little bit as um, as others were saying, that we could spend a significant amount of time um, uh, meeting and studying the process. Uh, we are in a race against time uh, right now. Uh, so, you know, we need to um, take action to make um, restoration projects and beneficial reuse uh, happen at a greater uh, pace and scale. I concur. Absolutely. I think that uh, uh, we've done a lot of studying in San Francisco Bay, and I'm not being critical, but I've had the opportunity to study and, and work in other regions, and, and we, are, we are behind. We need a regional sediment program, and we need a defined program over a long period of time of where you want your, uh, where we want our dredge spoils. We, we recognize that we have sea level rise. We recognize that we have an obligation to the communities around us, and we have the resources. We have the dredge, uh, we have the material resources to, uh, to protect ourselves. So we, we don't have a lot of time. And I do know that, uh, that the Corps has uh, worked with other regions, and uh, they have gotten support uh, from, uh, from the environmental and the local areas to. Uh, to bring about uh, the beneficial uh, use. Once you establish a, uh, a, a long-term beneficial use and you have a, an existing areas that you can concentrate on, uh, you would be very surprised what, what industry can do in reference to the cost effectiveness of this. The industry and the dredging industry are not, uh, are, are not ha haphazard in reference to spending capital and building assets to become cost effective in, in these regions. Right now, uh, a couple major dredging companies are spending over hundreds of millions of dollars in building new assets to accompany, to accompany uh, these regional demands. Once you see a regional demand take place, you will find that private industry will be, uh, will be very, very competitive in, in bringing that cost down. We've, we've heard a little bit about, you know, Government, uh, government dredges. To be really frank with you, the, we know on the hopper side of the business that uh, the government and the court does a great job administering and and regulating. But on the dredging side, there are there are 150 percent of our of our cost. Let the I think the dredging industry is is ready and willing 
uh, more so that if we had the regional plan, and we have a plan that we can that we can count on. You will you will find that uh, we can be very cost effective. Any other thoughts from the panel before we might go to some uh, audience Q, Q and A? I think we need a couple minutes just to set up for that. Any final thoughts? I'll just make another pitch. Larry gave a call to action. And there's an immediate action that's available to folks. There's uh, information on AA at the front table. Uh, if you're not sure how to support the effort, please get in touch with me. Uh, if you're not sure how to make a contribution, Diane Ross Leach from PG&E managed to get something through her company. Walt Gill from Chevron and others in the room can help you. I, I strongly urge you to take action right away at, while we're pursuing these actions that take uh, take longer time. Okay, great. I'm Jeff Rhodes, uh, Resilient Shore. Uh, Amy, this is really a question for you. As I've looked at the uh, legislation, uh, the, the um, um, Restoration Authority website, it wasn't clear to me what the role of uh, the Conservancy is on helping to vet grant applications for funds. Could you illuminate a bit what the process is for grant applications for AA funds? Sure. And this actually just went to the Restoration Authority Board at their last meeting um, a couple weeks ago. So the, the Coastal Conservancy and ABAG have been providing support to the Restoration Authority. The Restoration Authority um, the legislation passed in 2008 to establish the Restoration Authority. Uh, ABAG appoints um, the, the board members who are um, all local elected officials, um, but there is no funding um, for the Restoration Authority at this point. Um, you know, uh, no funding for staff, um, uh, etc. So the Conservancy and ABAG have been providing that su support, the uh, legal support, uh, clerking the stat the board meetings, um, developing um, uh, procedurals. So we've put together a grant making uh, procedural. It's available on the authority website and it describes the process um, that um, uh, the authority board will go through to make decisions about grants. We envision that there would be one to two requests for proposals each year. The RFP itself would be developed in conjunction with the advisory committee, which is about 40 different um, people. Uh, Richard Sinkoff is on the advisory committee, Grant Davis. Uh, I'm sure many other people in the audience are, are serving on this advisory committee. So we developed the RFP uh, in conjunction with the advisory committee. Um, it would go to the board, we would put it out, solicit applications, uh, and then um, uh, authority staff and other professionals um, in the field who do not have conflicts of interest uh, would evaluate um, the applications. Uh, and we, we have criteria, those are laid out both in the enabling legislation and in the actual ballot measure language, the criteria we would use to evaluate proposals. Uh, and then projects would be taken to the board at public board meetings um, for, um, for funding authorization. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, just add one uh, point as implied in what Amy said, but just to be explicit, the Restoration Authority doesn't have any staff right now. If AA passes, some small portion of those funds could be used for administrative expenses, which is only to administer this grant program. So the authority could hire its own staff to do that using the procedures that have been adopted, or it could contract with the Coastal Conservancy, which does very similar grant applications. So that hasn't been decided yet because there's no money to decide that on, but that is a, a likely outcome, a possible outcome. And what that means is that there's even more opportunity uh, for alignment between the Coastal Conservancy's own grant-making decisions with funds that it may have at its disposal in the future for this purpose, and the Restoration Authority's decisions. Um, the Coastal Conservancy, as you know, also manages projects, also owns property from time to time. 
The restoration authority is really, if, the, if Measure AA passes, its only purpose is to make these kinds of grants. Looks like we have another question in the back. Thank you. Uh, Warner Chabot, Executive Director of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. At the State of the Estuary Conference, there was a poster that I believe was put together by BCDC and the Coastal Conservancy that tried to just look at restoration sites around the bay. And they estimated, I believe, if I'm correct, that there was a need for somewhere between 175 to 200 million cubic yards of sediment just to meet kind of restoration projects that were on the drawing board. That doesn't even include the full goal of 100,000 uh, acres goal of, by 2030. So it seems like, if that's true, it seems like the magnitude of restoration sediment that we need is infinitely greater than what's being talked about here. You know, 200 million cubic yards, that's the equivalent of 200 Empire State Buildings on their side in the next 15 years. That's about 15 million cubic yards a year. Not one to two million, but 15 million. I mean, it seems like the need, if we're gonna meet the goal of 100,000 acres of restored wetlands by 2030 in 15 years, the rate at which we need to be looking at this seems to be extraordinarily greater at a, of a magnitude of, you know, five-fold of what's actually occurring right now, if not tenfold. So, so the question is, I mean, do you agree with those numbers? I mean, I mean are, are those numbers off, or has anybody looked at those numbers to say, what, what do we actually need in terms of actual cubic yards of sediment in the next 15 years to reach the 100,000-acre goal? Yeah, I think it's a second shortage. We have a shortage of money to get these projects done in the ideal way as quickly as possible. We have a shortage of sediment to get these projects done. And both those things need to be addressed. The first thing we need to stop doing is wasting or losing the opportunity to uh, re beneficially reuse the sediment that we do have and that is a part of maintenance dredging. And then pursue other <coughs> solutions for finding uh, mud or dirt in other places. Yeah, I believe that we, as I said earlier, we need to stop studying. You're exactly right. We're behind the curve. And uh, with the magnitude of those uh, numbers and what Amy is talking about, and what you just discussed, uh, you have a gold rush out here in reference to dredging. You want to you want to have lower dredging costs. You come up with a plan like that, and you could uh, you could build a, a lot here. I mean, I, I really strongly believe that uh, that we really do need the, a regional settlement plan, and it's just the start of our overall need of what's going to be affecting us by sea level rise. And I would just add, um, beneficial use is one source of sediment, an important source of sediment. Um, there are other sources of sediment that we need to make sure are better managed as well. So um, uh, dirt from, clean dirt from construction projects, um, that is being used in the South Bay. Uh, where there's you know significant development, Apple puts in a basement. We want that dirt. Um, it comes in little boxes. Um, we drop, drop it uh, at Bear Island. Um, but we also need to use the sediment from our watersheds um, more effectively. So um, from our local watersheds, from uh, the delta, any sediment coming into the system, we need to make sure that it's going um, to the place where it's needed the most. So that. Um, you know, I think that's on the restoration community, making sure that we design our projects in the best way possible to take advantage of sediment from our watersheds. I, I'll ask a question since nobody else has raised their hand yet. Um, if Measure AA fails, and it's unlikely that we're going to see new monies from the federal or state government coming forward, what's going to happen? to uh, shoreline resiliency and creation of wetlands here in the Bay Area. But what's going to happen is what's happening now. We're, we're, we're running out of money. Uh, and while there's interest in getting more federal and state money, I think the odds of that are significantly decreased if Measure AA, which has been really 13 years in development, this idea from the first conversation I remember having with Byron Share in 2004. Um, with all the support that we've raised and the broad coalition and the 
relative absence of formal opposition, the money that we've raised for the campaign, if, if, all, if all of that is not enough to mobilize a two-thirds support vote from the Bay Area, then what powerful claim do we have for this being a priority for state funding? What powerful claim do we have for this being a priority for federal funding? Um, I, I think it leaves us in a, in a, not just the deep hole that we're in, but a deepening hole. Uh, we can't afford not to pass this. We really can't. And I don't mean to suggest it's going to solve all our problems, but a half a billion dollars is a pretty good start. And the bragging rights for this region, that we are taking care of part of this challenge ourselves. We are taking care of part of this challenge ourselves, and there's a federal interest and a public interest and a state interest in a healthy bay and a protected shoreline. And we deserve matching funds. We deserve leveraged funds. And that puts us in a very, very powerful position. And, and uh, that's where we want to be. Hi, um, I'm Diane Russell with pg and &E. I think, Bill, you mentioned a couple of times what we need is a regional plan for use of sediment. So I'm wondering, What's it going to take to get that? What are the impediments to making that happen? Well, I think that uh, what I've seen in other areas that uh, I, I believe that the core has a has a good a good conduit in uh, in in bringing people together instead of the uh, instead of the environmental side of the arm. Uh, it's like the tail wagging the dog. I think that uh, we need to be uh, forthright. Get in a room. Put the environmental uh, sector in 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 with us and and develop a, a partnership that we can come up with uh, competitive and uh, and and streamlined processes on especially on the maintenance uh, side. Frankly, uh, we see the maintenance side of the of the dredging industry uh, studied to death to the point that uh, it it becomes so cumbersome that there's very little time within the operating windows to actually really do the job. So I think that uh, that instead of having the environmental groups on the outside looking in, they should be on the inside. They should roll up their sleeves, sit around the table, and along with uh, with the industry, uh, there's dredging associations, there's the core, there's the, there's the different uh, fish and wildlife, there's all the agencies that combine. Put them in the same room and, uh, and, and work on a, on a partnership to come up with a, a cost-effective and, and a more uh, effective uh, program. And I think we see that in other areas. We don't see it here in San Francisco Bay. We'll get a dredging project that uh, was, is supposed to come out and it'll get, uh, unfortunately, studied to death. And that, that doesn't help us because that puts a lot of pressure on our shipping industries, our commerce industries, and uh, I think we can do ourselves well. No different than the AA. It may not be all the, uh, all the dirt that we need, but it's a beginning, and it's a place for us to get additional beneficial use out of it. So I think we need more support in a partnering on the environmental side to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Another question on the side of the room, John? Or? Is there another question out there? Uh, we'll ask Will Travis, then we have one. We'll go back there. We're gold band. Grant Davis and I were joking about remembering the billboards that used to say, clean fill wanted and we have to get some of those billboards back. The question I have is instead of LTMS 2.0, is LTMS 1.1 a possibility? And that is simply take ocean disposal out of the equation. Will that change the core calculus and make beneficial reuse more feasible? Al? That will definitely change the equation outcome. Um, that SF DOT, San Francisco Deep Ocean Disposal Site, is the federal standard placement site for Oakland Harbor and Richmond Harbor, our two biggest annual dredging projects. Um, and again, it is, it satisfies the least cost test. Now, if that's taken off the table somehow through regulation, I don't know how you guys would do that, but uh, then it's no longer 
environmentally acceptable, and that would fit the second prong of that test. So um, I guess I'm saying yes, it changes the game. I'll ask a follow-up, though. I mean, is, that, is there a downside to that in terms of relative cost between ocean and beneficial okay, reuse downside. Currently? It's uh, going to cost us more to do our, execute our program. We're fighting for every dollar uh, at headquarters. Um, we will probably, if we don't get help from our uh, local partners, uh, we will have to dredge less value for those projects, simply put. I have a question for Al, actually, as a follow-up to that. Do you think there are other things within the O&M dredging um, contracting world that could be done to bring down costs? Um, I, I know there have been value engineering studies over the years, and it does seem like um, there are ways to do uh, larger, longer contracts that could bring down the cubic yard cost, and, and then beneficial reuse um, maybe can be added on, but the cost still uh, be, be low. Okay, well, that's a good question, and we continually to look at that, um, that kind of a thing. I mean, uh, our latest example is our Oakland O&M um, project with um, Dutra Dredging. We have a three-year contract with them, and we're in our um, still in our first year of that contract, and I think there is savings in economies of scale. Um, so the bigger the job, I think the lower the price is the basic yeah, rule there. The, the, long, the, uh, the longer duration, uh, the clearer scope, and the amount of yardage uh, always brings the, it brings the cost, cost down. I mean, we we see it when uh, when you have a capital project. So uh, our our projects right now on, on maintenance and time windows are too small and too tight, and uh, they cause a lot of impact to uh, mobilization, gearing up, and then the and then the exhaustment of uh, studying it uh, within the windows that uh, we need to operate on. You can bring those costs down by having a longer uh, longer duration or a clearer scope on the project, if it's going to be out in the ocean or it's going to be upwind. Does that also bring down the cost on the, dis on the, uh, the disposal of the beneficial reuse side? I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the comments that we collected for the panel was that the, it's not just the dredging and transport, but the, the use of the offloader as a premium. Does that affect that well, cost? Well, like I said, I think the offloader, once we designate uh, specific areas, uh, you know, our, our bay has a lot of shallowness to it. so. Uh, we're, we're struggling with uh, areas to go. Hamilton Field was a, was a good example. We had to pump eight miles to, to get it. It took a big capital project to make it work. You're not going to clean out San Rafael Creek or some marina and try to shove it eight miles down the, down the road. I think you have to, we have to come up with a program that you have some d d defined aquatic sites that will fit for the small harbors, will submit for, for the marinas, submit for the, for the maintenance dredging. Once you define that, then you allow industry to uh, put its capital towards it and drive that cost down. To say that you're going to put a government dredge in there to, to subsidize or assist private enterprise, uh, you'll just sit there and wait. You're, you're, you're actually blocking yourself until we really need to define do you want to go out in the ocean 61 miles or do you want to go upland or do you want to go down by off the shores of Redwood City? Once those defined management settlement programs are run, you will see a substantial drop in your cost. I just want to chime in. So um, I don't know if Philip Trevetti is here, but he, he called me yesterday to remind me about a report that Moffat and Nickel did um, on, on Eden Landing. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna go through these numbers because um, I think I think it's a, a good example. Um, they found that um, Eden Landing needs seven point you could use seven point two million cubic yards over five years. Um, if that came from Oakland Inner, Oakland Outer, Redwood City, and a few small projects, um, there's the, the capacity to make that happen. The cost would be twenty million dollars to prep the site. Uh, so that's you know, presumably on, on us to get the site ready to receive dredge material. Uh, that works out to a $3 per cubic yard cost just for the site prep. And then they estimated a $10 per cubic yard cost to get the material to the site. So 
all the cost except for the actual dredging. That's $13 a cubic yard. That is, that is not uh, that, that much, you know, compared to um, some of the other uh, places that dredge material goes. So how, why can we not make this happen? It's, um, I think, you know, that's what the restoration community is struggling with, is how, 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 um, how do we organize um, this group of people, perhaps um, uh, private investors, to, to make this happen? Because it it's cost effective, actually. John, do we have another question? Or? What we're going to do is something a little different. Uh, Larry Goldspan, who opened up with the call to action, is sort of going to close this with the call to action. And uh, after that, we'll then have our break. Larry? Gee, thanks. Um, I, I think that, that two things strike me after this conversation. The first is a sense of Groundhog Day. That is that a lot of what has been said here this morning has been said before. And it's been said before in at least three or four different ways by three or four different people. And I think that that's not necessarily bad. I think that a lot of times we have to say things a lot of times before we actually figure out how to actually do something. But the thing that makes me feel really glad about today is that you have four people sitting up there who have fundamentally different responsibilities. And I think that's something that we all have to consider when we give a call to action. That is, Al's responsibility is fundamentally different than David's. And that's a good thing. Amy's responsibility is fundamentally different than Bill's. And that's a good thing. From my perspective, as both a regulator and a planner, what needs to be done now is to put our heads together in a way, maybe not to do LTMS 1.1, but maybe think a little bit bigger and do LTMS 1.2, which is just a little bit bigger than that, but gets us beyond talking to the extent that the next time we have this discussion in a year, there's actual advancement based upon the approval of AA and based upon getting those people in the but I'll go back to my original call to action. The real issue, I think, to solve this is that we have to look at the long game. We have to look 30 years down the road. We have to look 20 years down the road, which isn't too long in geologic times, but it's eons politically. And unless we actually always have the long game in front of us, which is a real challenge for regulators, then we're not going to get where we need to go. So thank you. And on behalf of the Bay Planning Coalition, I'd like to thank the panel for leading this first discussion. Uh, they did a phenomenal job, job so please thank all of them.